essentially, right? Because the police will need to, for certain types of investigation, they will have to have, they have to have access to like looking at things on the internet, or they get custom content, right? Like someone puts up a, a threatening post somewhere, but they say if it comes from the FBI website or the Information Ministry website, then um, give them something else. Or maybe there are police inside. Anybody hear of this thing called police corruption? You ever hear of police corruption? Does that happen in Jordan? Oh. Never? No. Okay. So, okay, well, it also does not happen in America. Okay. There's no police corruption anywhere in the world, right? I mean, let's face it, you know, like, it's, it's a reality. There are sometimes, there are sometimes people that abuse their privilege, they abuse their power that they have. And um, I think that it's important that if someone wants to report a real crime, that they should be able to report that crime in a way that does not incriminate them, right? And the thing is that the police can't run an anonymity network that you use because if you have them running this anonymity network and you use it, then you're obviously a, someone who's reported this. And that means that the police have privileged access to who used it. So again, it's privacy by policy. But in some cases, there could be serious retribution. If you were reporting a really like, uh, like a very dangerous criminal that, that committed an, an egregious crime, and you're the one that's gonna put them in jail for the rest of their life, that's probably not something you wanna trust with a cop who maybe makes not enough money that they won't take a bribe, right? So you want to have an anonymity network for that as well. So it's not just for the police doing investigations, it's also so that you as a citizen could report something like that. And if, who here has heard of the website WikiLeaks? So WikiLeaks.org, you should all write this down. If you take one thing away from the talk, go to WikiLeaks.org. They, they publish leak documents that are published anonymously. So people often use Tor to connect to WikiLeaks to send them documents. They published 500,000 pager messages from September 11th in America. They published the Guantanamo Bay Operations Manual, which showed the US government had systematically oppressed the people of Guantanamo Bay in a very specific way. So they couldn't say that it wasn't an order or that it was an isolated incident, but it was in fact definitely that way and by policy. And they leak documents about serious oil spills off the coast of Africa and chemical dumpings. Things that if any newspaper were to report them, the newspaper would lose all their funding. They would get cut, people would get killed. Like literally, uh, WikiLeaks was working with two journalists in Africa that during the Kenyan election, they were assassinated, right? So the anonymity portion of, of WikiLeaks keeps people safe and it allows journalists to do their job in a really important way. And of course, um, if you are working in, uh, this is really unpopular Alice, by the way, <laughs> the coalition member Alice, right? Um, but if you were working like in some capacity as a government person, you, you would want to be able to be anonymous, right? Like we mentioned this with the FBI, or I mentioned this with the FBI. Um, but even governments have legitimate needs where they need to be anonymous, where they need to be able to read stuff, where they need to be able to see things. Um, and especially because if you are using a service, like, like Google is a good example, um, if you were using a service like Google, it would be possible for Google, if they had an insider, to say like, well, what does the Jordanian Ministry of Information use Google for every day? What are the, the, these patterns that they, that they sort of exhibit? So that's, that's something that's a little bit, maybe a little bit scary. And we discussed this as well, right? You have, sh you have each one of these people trying to solve the problem on their own. And it's very typical, you see this everywhere in technology, it's like people don't want to actually solve it for everybody because that doesn't really work. And so instead, what we have is this. We have a shared anonymity network, right? So it's kind of a jump there to talk about the specifics, but basically, if you have all these people and they cooperate together, now when someone uses that network to connect, you do not know who they are. You can't correlate, this person is from Jordan, this person is from Lebanon, and they're trying to connect to this website. Well, there's like five people in Jordan that we know that are interested in this, but there's 10,000 people worldwide that are interested in this. And so it makes it a lot harder, for example, to track down that person, to treat them differently, or to target them. And we, we use the phrase, anonymity loves company, for this. And 
one of the, the, big, uh, the big questions that we get is like, well, but bad people will use this. And like, who here has ever been on the street and seen something terrible happen? Right? Like someone was rude, they said something that was offensive. Or maybe you, like, for example, like, have been the victim of harassment in some way. Or perhaps you use the internet and you saw the same thing. So Tor suffers the same problem when people are unmuzzled, when they are free to think, when they are free to speak without repercussions directly in that second, where it is hard for a machine to target them, you will have some people doing bad things. And it's relative. In China, for example, talking about the Falun Gong is not allowed, right? Talking about Tiananmen Square and the democratic uprising that occurred, that is totally not okay, right? And so the thing is that these things, they're bad in certain political contexts. But in, in the case of, say, like a criminal, Criminals already have like way better resources. They can steal your mobile phone, and they have pretty pretty good anonymity, right? Because if they don't get caught for stealing your mobile phone, it looks like you did it. It's great. That's a great attack, right? Or a laptop, or using an open wireless network, or hacking a computer, right? So you you know you have all of these different options if you're a criminal. So Tor, what Tor does is it says everybody should have this right without being a criminal to speak freely, to be able to access content freely. Right, the United Nations talks about access to information as a human right. And what Tor is trying to do is to make that a reality for everyone. So you don't need a botnet, you don't have to steal a telephone, you don't have to leave a track behind. And uh, I like this slide because it's just buzzwords. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But it's, I mean, like, there's all sorts of stuff you can do if you want to break the law, right? But there are not many options if you want to not break the law unless using cryptography or being anonymous is illegal in your country, in which case you're going to break the law, probably. So at least break the law in a way that's not going to come back to bite you too hard, hopefully. I mean, I'm not advocating that you break the law. I'm just advocating that if you were going to break the law, that you should probably make sure that you don't break the law in a way where a company will come back and sell your information. For example, there is a company that made circumvention tools for um, Asia. And they actually offered to sell the information about the individual users. Like, have you ever wondered what a dissident in China Googles for? Well, for $5 a person, we'll tell you. And if you'd like more targeted information about a particular user, you just let us know. <laughs> Probably if it's illegal to use circumvention tools there, that is a really, really bad idea to use that network. And it's even worse in that case, but it might be bad even if it's not illegal because maybe someone will blackmail you with that information. They'll try to say, well, I'll tell your family if you, uh, if you don't do what I say, because I've identified you, I know who you are. I have your email, I know who you are. And so, of course, um, bad people, they're gonna do, I think, pretty well on the internet without it. But with something like Tor, you have the ability to, to like escape that. You can even escape the clutches of a lot of bad people, especially if you use encryption when you use Tor. So, if you visit a website with SSL, that's something that is going to be a lot better for you because you have confidentiality, even from the Tor network itself. So to give you an idea, the early designs of anonymity networks were not really even networks. They're just proxies. Who here has used a proxy? OK. So about half of you are familiar with this. You send your data to the proxy. Is there anything wrong with this? Like, can you see any problems here? Your data. Say that again? You send your data to anonymous. Yeah, so you send your data to a proxy. Um, so there are, a couple, there are a couple things that could go bad with that, right? One is, how do you know to trust that relay, right? This is, a, this is a system that is effectively a privacy by policy system. But even if they have a perfect policy, which they often don't, if they're bad, they see that Alice Wong is talking to Bob 3, right? So they see everything. And if, for example, they're chatting and there's no encryption involved, then you have to ask yourself, how can you trust them? 